Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day everyone, Clayton here from XY Advisor. Pretty stoked to have Connell here today on the podcast. We met during the XY party tour in Melbourne a couple of weeks back. Thanks for coming on, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, at the time it was November and you were rocking the, I would say, you were pretty proud. It was quite a seedy mustache. Um, did you end up raising much money? Uh, I did. It was a good November. Growing a mo is always fun. Uh, yes, yeah, me and a couple of guys, I think we got to maybe $1,600, yeah, you know, fantastic. as a group, which is, you know, it's not nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, funnily enough, I was learning about, you could call it the business model of uh, Movember, and they are one of the biggest charities in the world. So, you know, anyone that's doing stuff for uh, sort of mental health, I think should be um, sort of applauded, which sort of led to you doing... Oh, and, and if any advisors don't know, Connell does a, you know, a lot of video and you do, you do quite well out of that. And um, I think mainly because of those $30 lights that you bought from eBay, just made the hey, complexion. It's all, it's all about lighting. It's all about lighting. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the videos you've done recently is a video on mental health. And we were, we were chatting about it just previously. And you were saying that very strange, or at least to me, a very strange way to acquire clients. And that is um, people were coming to you and saying, hey, actually love the video. How do I get my family member to pay attention? Can you walk us through that? Because I've never seen that before. Yeah, so the the Movember video that I did, um, I think we all talked about it. I think we even talked about it at the Christmas party was the connection between money and mental health is a lot bigger than we know. Um, and then when I made the video, I actually started doing some research and like the numbers really did start to back it up. It's like, Hey, you know, uh, young men, men are spending money. Then they're getting into their thirties and forties and spending a ridiculous amount of money. And then it, the people in the forties and 45s were then killing themselves due to relationship breakdown and money problems. So I thought it was like, Hey, great theme. I do this video. Didn't expect much of a response from it. Um, you know, you get shares, you get likes, fine. Um, but what I've had is probably a handful and continuing to grow of people looking for help with finances, but not from the individual, not from the man, from their family members, from their daughters or wives or whoever. Um, and they're literally saying, hey, I watched your video and my partner or my husband has this issue where he's got money problems, doesn't want to talk about it. H how do I approach the subject? How do I, what do you tell me what I need to tell him so he can come and talk to you. Yeah. Um, and it's not once, it's been multiple times I've had that um, conversation. That's really unique, right? Like, yeah. were you expecting something like that? It, initially, no. And then it just kind of kept happening over and over again. And you then think about, like, picture a guy and he's 30, uh, you know, 55 or 60. And, you know, the pride that is wrapped up in money and life and you've got to be the main breadwinner to then turn around and have a conversation with some 35, 40 year old financial advisor you know, no, I, I don't want to have that conversation. Um, and the other question I've asked is, have they talked to a financial advisor in the past? And all of them had said yes. And I think that old financial planner of, hey, I just want to sell you super insurance has probably also put a stop to that conversation thread. Yeah. Interesting. So what is your process then in terms of family member X comes to you, says, this is the case with my brother, husband, father, um, how do you take that conversation to the next step? It's giving that person the resources to have a better conversation with that family member um, to, to open that dialogue box. 
sometimes you don't want to do it directly. You want to do it indirectly. Um, one of the things I learned from my father is he doesn't like paying tax. So if you can have a conversation around, hey, this person might be able to save you some tax, or this person might be able to help you with your property decisions, actually coming from a positive, or not, not masculine, but coming from a healthy direction, not an unhealthy. If you say, hey, this person's going to make you feel better about your money, I don't, I don't think that's the method. It's really saying, hey, did you know this, this, and this? Try that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about having the videos is you can then say, and I've done this a couple of times, go show this video to that person. That will resonate with them. So go show the tax zones and how you can pay 0% tax in this video. That will then introduce both me and a concept. And then from there forward, a conversation ensues. One of the things, we're just listening to you talk about uh, advice and how you handle this sort of situation, which is quite unique, um, I would say you come at it from a very well thought out from a psychological point of view. Do you have a, a psych degree or a background in that sort of stuff? Um, well, I'm Irish, so there's, there's always going to be some <laughs> level of psychological uh, elements there. I definitely have done a couple of psychology units, but I quit because I didn't agree with the way that they, they were doing it too methodically. Um, right. I was shy growing up, and I'm not anymore. Um, and I thought myself through it. Um, I have had those days where you don't want to get out of bed and I am now happy. So I think that is one angle. Yeah. I, I really just think a lot of it and a lot of financial advisors almost need to do it more is just put yourself in the position of the other person. Yeah. Like what, what does someone need to say to you to get you to go talk to someone you don't want to talk about? Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a really good question to ask. And, yeah. and the whole thing with creating content uh, is the idea that you can create relationships, albeit one-sided relationships, but you can create relationships at scale with many people simultaneously. So yep. um, as you're doing videos and sort of promoting uh, opinions about money, um, people can vicariously create a relationship with you, which then makes the introduction to talking to you about uh, money a lot easier. So you've obviously said, okay, the way that I would like to engage with a profession or a service is to get to know the person first. Therefore, um, you've reverse engineered that and then ended up with, okay, video is the right um, decision for me. I'll, I'll ask uh, if you were no, like if you were a quiet child and now you feel comfortable with doing videos because I will say it's actually nerve wracking. Like I've done, yeah, hun I've done hundreds of podcasts, yeah, yeah. But, but I don't really view this. Like it, this is just a conversation. This and is that, easier there's, because it's back and forth. Yeah. And, and also like it, it's, it's off the cuff, but then when you're like sitting there and the camera's there and you've it's got terrible. The things it's terrible. there. It is so, terrible. So, so how, how did you, Considering you, you've made the decision, this is what I'm going to do, how did you get over those internal barriers? Uh, it is not easy. I remember having a conversation with uh, Ron Pratap, who I think, I don't know, I think it was you that actually interviewed him on the XY ages ago. Yeah. And he was like, hey, I've just done videos, you should do videos, you're loud, you're confident, off you go. And I'm like, there is no way someone can get me talking in front of a camera. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, when you're putting it out into the world, you're like, well, who's going to watch this? And other financial people are going to watch this. And do I share it on my personal? Everyone's going to think I'm a douchebag. <laughs> so there's that. As soon as the camera starts rolling, you freeze up. You won't be, you, you, it's just, it's just this weird feeling. Yeah. The other thing that happens is you then get stuck on like one sentence and you just cannot get past. <laughs> so the first video that I did, which never got to the light of day, I was like, I'll just do one sentence at a time and I'm just going to snip them all together. And it was literally just like cut, 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 or I could only do one <laughs> sentence at a time. Um, so but the point is you just start, you go, okay, that was bad. And then you yeah. try again. Um, and figure out what works for you. One person, it might be a, hey, maybe it's a one take process. For me, you, if you look at any of my videos, I've got screen things that come up and that are my cut points. So when I'm making it, I know I can just get through this part and there's going to be something on the screen. I get this part, there's something on the screen. Um, and as my videos go longer, there's more sections where I can just ramble on. So like all things in life, it's just try it and fail. And you, the, one of the things that you do 
in my personal opinion, really well is you, like the setup you use is essentially the setup you've got in this conversation right now. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And the thing that I really like about that is it's low. Mm, I, I tell you what, you've done a lot of hard work to make it look like you not trying. So I want to yep. be, you want to be careful. <laughs> no, no. no, I'll take that. Yeah. So I know my personality. If I had to set up everything and have this whole setup, I just wouldn't do it. I'm, I'm at one video a month and even that, it takes me a while. Yep. I literally have lights sitting here and when I sit down, they're there and I do not pack them away. I don't do anything. So I can so just sit good. down and just go and go. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it probably took me about a year to go and go this, like they're literally $30 lights off eBay. You just get some colorful light in the background. You get a camera that's got a little bit of um, aperture to it. So you get a bit of a blur and all of a sudden this like really crap video turns into something that is now, you know, looks good. Actually, what um, camera do you use? Because my camera clearly sucks. Okay, so I just use a Canon 80D, um, and it. But the lens is like a uh, it's a 22 mil lens, which might have cost a hundred bucks. It's the right. lens that is at the actual bit. Right. Um, the other part to it is back to the last question. I think looking at it and being proud of the screen was a helping factor in me. So when I was yeah. set, doing this setup and I just looked crap, I'm like, I don't want to put that out there. When I got this it looking good that was an extra little element to being able to go public yeah and i fully 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 agree with you there because um a few years ago after i wrote fund your idea lifestyle i thought because mm, i was very recently out of advice i thought mm, i might try to like start a i don't know like a, a business based around me talking about stuff. I don't sure. know. I, I was, yeah. I was, you know, I was thinking maybe I'll do that kind of thing, but turns out uh, I'm far more effective when people uh, don't see me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and and uh, and so I did a bunch of these videos, and because I didn't have a good setup, I, I, like I I tried really really hard to seem like um, what. I was saying was important and I put a lot of effort into like setting up all this stuff and it just looked weird. And then I'd sort of, to get away from that, I did low fire sort of like walking around the city with my camera, like holding my phone. Cause I thought, oh, okay, I'll go casual, but I just look like an idiot. And, and, and funnily enough, like I've purposely kept those videos on YouTube under my own personal account because like I do look dumb and it, it reminds me that uh, putting in the effort to get comfortable so that it doesn't take much effort is so the goal. And uh, yeah, I can definitely see uh, that it's worked for you. Yeah. And every single video you make, you look back and go, oh, that last one was crap and the next one's going to be better. So there's definitely this evolution in it as well. Like it's yeah, just, yeah. it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so one of the, one of the interesting things that we got speaking about in Melbourne was your journey from being an employed advisor through to a self-employed advisor through to being self-licensed. Yep. And uh, that's a super interesting journey and a journey that probably um, many advisors are out there interested in learning about. Um, can you talk to us about where were you employed? You know, how, like what's that story to becoming self-employed? Yeah. Um, I'll give you the quick version and you can then go back and, uh, you know, ask extra questions if you want sure. to. Um, so we both did Horizons. So we yep. both had that experience. Um, before that, I was in property. I had a real estate agency. Mum and dad bought and right. sold property. So I've got this property background. Um, went and did the AMP Horizons course, finished it and went, well, wait a second. I still can't give financial advice <laughs> to property investors. The, bit, the thing that I was trying to work out, it just wasn't there. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm really interested in the strategic advice part. Is like, yeah. if, if you do this or this, how is it going to work out? So I was like, all right, I'm not going to work for an AMP practice. Never did. Yep. Um, and I went and found a property centric uh, employer, yep. um, which you know they had its pros, but it also had an element of that whole new property sales, which I'm allergic to. So right. ran away from that. Became self employed. Um, and then around the same time that I was self-employed with my license, a mate who was in AMP Horizons also went self-employed. And as you know, what does it take? Three months to get money in the door? Four months to get money in the door? It takes a while. Yes. So three or four months in, um, Dover shuts down. He was, he was licensed with Dover. 
So, you know, he is now told, you know, good work on that first three months of nothing. Go start again. Um, oh, man. So that is tricky for him. Um, and we had a conversation with him and we ended up bringing him into my business as a second AR. Cool. Cool. Um, and the reason we did that was because it's cheaper to be having two ARs in one car, one business, than it is to have two cars. Yes. Fine. So that's Ben and he's now part of What If Advice. Um, and then what we learned was what we were doing was sharing costs. So it was a symbiotic relationship where we're now splitting our license fee. We're splitting, if we were going to go sign up to My Prosperity, you could now split that fee. So everything was divided by 50%, which just made sense. Yeah. Um, so then you start going, hey, will I have to look for a new license? What's involved in that? What about self-licensing? How does that work? We just did the research kind of the same way we do for clients. You know, hey, if you want to switch to Superfund, well, there's fees and features and what do you get for your money and all that kind of stuff. We just did that. And it just worked out for us that getting our own license was actually going to be uh, not only cheaper, but all these other added benefits. So yeah, we took the plunge within 12 months. Interesting. I actually want to ask a question um, even before you got into advice. Uh, You said you were a real estate agent. Yep. This is a question I've asked a couple of times and I can't get an answer, but I feel like you're probably the first person I can ask sure. is going to be able to give me a good answer here. Why don't advisors have a real estate license? Well, we don't, as an advisor, I do not say to a client, go and buy a property, 123 Smith Street. I'm but, not- but, but, would you sell, so, but would you sell someone's property if they wanted to? If they, if they came to you and said, we, I want to sell a property, yep. um, why considering advisors are getting into accounting, into mortgages, uh, you know, expanding their list of offerings, why is real estate this still no go? I feel like I'm missing something because no one's doing it. Why, why wouldn't you sell a client's property? Um, I, I, I could. Um, like I rent my own house out, like our investment property. I go and do it. Yep. Um, one barrier to entry was realestate.com. So you had to have a realestate.com license or whatever it is. And that was expensive. And real estate agents pay for the agency to get your property on realestate.com. So if you don't have that, you're right. out of the game. However, there are now companies out there that will allow you to list one property at a time. Through yeah, there's, B, there's B4, right? There's, there's all, all those ones. And that's yeah. how I rented out my property in, uh, in Richmond. We did that. So to answer your question, you could technically help somebody sell their property or, you know, get your real estate license and totally do it. Um, it's, it's one of those things like, do you want to wear multiple hats? Um, you know, there's, it's, I, I think it's just that question. Sure. Um, also, the real estate agents, you getting the listings is the hardest part. And then also the property negotiations, the hard part, but putting it up on realestate.com and doing stuff on a Saturday, it's time where you don't get paid. So it's, yeah, it, there's something there. Um, but it's not, it's set. So when you, when you have, I get to a point in your career where your clients are retiring and they're downsizing. Yep. You uh, currently, you wouldn't see it worth it. You selling their properties. Um, one of the things that is, I like when I talk to financial advisors and they say, Hey, this client needs Centrelink help and I'm not the best person for that job. And I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. Yeah. Could I sell someone's house? Yes. Am I the best per- person for the job? Um, maybe not. Cool. You get the, the information you get as a real estate agent week in, week out feedback from the market. That is really, really important. So when you say that property values have gone up by X, that actually happened three months ago or six months ago, and the data is only now. So right. you, you need to be like on the, on the floor and in, you know, in the moment to really be able to sell that property for its most in that moment. So right. That, okay. That's my answer. Yeah. Okay, cool. So realistically, then the answer is. Uh, selling a property is not like accounting because uh, account- accountancy doesn't change dramatically yeah. and it's more static, whereas yeah. um, real estate is far more dynamic and you're re- relying yeah. on market feedback. And yeah. as an advisor, it's difficult to stay at the top of your game in real totally. estate, so it's probably not going to get the best result for the client. Yep. Thank you. Good. I mean, yeah, mate. Like, totally. Like, I now fully understand yeah. why uh, advisors don't get into it. So, thanks very much. And that, that's only one element. There's probably a couple more in there. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. 
Um, okay, cool. So, so you move into advice. Uh, how long were you self-licensed before you sort of jumped across into, uh, sorry, how long were you self-employed before you jumped across into self-licensed land? So the self-licensing process took us probably seven months. Okay. So how, did, uh, not did, that long. What, so is, is, months, there a co- is there a cost to getting your own license? Yeah. So you've got an ASIC fee that you have to pay to apply. Yep. Um, I'm using rough numbers now. Call it five grand. Okay. So the next thing is you can apply yourself or you can get someone else to help you apply. We, we got someone else to help us apply. Okay, cool. So when people say it costs $5,000 to start a license, what they're really saying is it costs $5,000 to pay ASIC. Yep. But there are additional costs above and beyond that, especially yeah. if you need some help. That's right. Cool. And then and the, different, the, the level of complexity of your license would change the complexity of the application. Um, I think we had a lot of benefits because we were new and starting fresh. It was probably just all a bit easier like starting early, early was almost an easier process than doing it, you know, down the track. What, what would, um, what would be a complexity that would increase the cost? Well, if you want to do MBAs or if you want to do margin lending, or if you want to do like what your license can do as you add that on, that that's an element. Yeah. Right. And, and, they're, and they're going to ASIC will ask you, well, who's the directors of the business? How many people are involved in this? Like that, the informa- the disclosure information there increases, the rest, you know, there's just, when there's more, there's more. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And so, and how long have you been self-licensed for now? Uh, I want to say February this year. Yeah, right. Yep. Cool. And what, what would you say between being employed, self-employed and having your own license? What would you say is the best? I think it's personality traits. So for me, it's being self-licensed, self-employed, but I can understand why that's not for everybody. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think a good way to describe it is, is an industry fund better or worse than a self-managed super fund? One's not better or worse. One is just appropriate or not appropriate. So a self-licensed is a self-managed super fund where I have all the features, but I've got all the fees. Yes. No, However, that makes sense. And an SMSF can also be cheaper than an industry fund if the balance is high. Yes. So I actually think that our our process is actually one of the cheapest. Interesting. So um, have, do you have a sort of a goal to to grow the license or is it something that you want to keep boutique? No, no, we are looking at growing it. So much of the relationship I have with Ben where we shared fees, we're kind of doing something similar to that. So if we add on one, two, three, four advisors, like a small number, we are then able to pull our resources together and share those costs. The license is not a for-profit business. It's a tool that we use. We're effectively outsourcing to ourselves a yep. license. We now outsource our compliance. We outsource our um, who does our um, uh, revenue every month or whatever. So, and we add up all those costs and it's still cheaper than the license fees. So yeah. Um, a conversation that I had the other day was with Sam Henderson and he, we were going through sort of in detail, what were the mistakes that he felt he made? Um, and he listed quite a number. He, he said, you know, like he, he probably should have paid more attention here and here and here and here and here. And he said, he goes, to be honest, like he probably should have read the corpse act like yeah. started there yep. figured out how it relates to his business simply because of the high standard that advisors are held to especially in the black swan event that you're ever called into account so yep. um i guess like while i don't really particularly see that as a potential threat like i i considering the long 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 tail now of thousands of small licensees of less than five um, authorized reps um i don't really see it being a threat of ever ending up in on a stand somewhere but do you feel an increased i guess sense of responsibility to understand 
the rules and regulations now that you have your own license? So yes, is my answer to that. But the question I pose back to you is, shouldn't we already have that? <laughs> oh, look, so, 100%. Like, so, so this is the thing that I think when I have conversations with about compliance with people, I really start from a, it's try to use common sense compliance. So if you've got a question, go back to the CorpSec, call ASIC, don't use what you read on some forum this one time that we have to do this. Um, yeah. Make Have your own opinion. So go read something, go, I, I, I've read it and I think what they mean is this and this is what I'm going to do. So if yeah. you put me up on a stand, I will say, this came in, I did this for this reason and I stand by it. If you think I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But this is, I, I, I made up my own mind. I wasn't told by someone else and I'm now not going to point to that person and say, well, it's their fault. They told me to do this and now it's my, you know. Because it does, that, that pointing to the other person doesn't get you anywhere anyway. No, and this is the thing that people say is like, hey, you've got your own license, aren't you worried about compliance? And, and my thing is, I think it's this false sense of security that advisors have that they've got this dealer group and the dealer group's going to protect them. I just don't think that's the case. No, it, and, and it's definitely not the case. Uh, yeah. According to Sam, it was like, you know, it's, it's uh, that old saying, I can't remember who said it, banks are an umbrella and, yeah, I know, you know, until it starts raining, right? Yeah. So the, the license is there for your protection until such time as you're in trouble. And, and then uh, basically because, you, because the person becomes toxic, everyone removes themselves and they yeah. bail. And I mean, that's just human nature. That's just yeah. common sense. No one wants to get pulled down with anything. So at, what you're saying, you know, while it being... Uh, rather uh, a lot of it's self-responsibility. It's common sense because the people yep. ultimately at the end of the day that will hold you to account are not relationship style people. They're not going, oh, mistakes happen, blah, 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 blah. They go, this is the law and this is what you did wrong. Yep. And uh, I love your idea of like, have a, have a say, yep. read the Corpse Act, have a look at how it applies to, to what it is that you're doing. And, make a call. Yep. Mate, I love it. Well done. So let's talk about where advice is headed because, sure. because, <laughs> because yeah, I'm amazing at segues, by the way, if you didn't yeah, notice. Nice. That. I like it. Um, so uh, if you consider for a moment, the future of advice, uh, you're going to have uh, competition from robo advice. You're going to have, um, competition from you know bureaucracy which is trying to solve a problem maybe the results aren't in the best way but where do you see yourself sort of winding through and and finding a valuable space for your clients and for yourself um cool so where is it heading i think that um, one of the reasons why we did get in the path of having our own license was for this very question is that we don't know. We don't know where it's heading. So therefore, the more control we can have, the more we're able to pivot and do things in the future. So a lot of this had to do with what does the future look like? So there's that. The next part is, and it all draws together. So the conversation around psychology and the conversation about real, uh, real estate is humans aren't changing. Can, will there be robo advice for real simplistic, you know, hey, I want a cheaper super fund, here you go. Sure, fine, and we don't want to play in that space. You always need human interaction when we're dealing with human psychology. Totally. The main uh, thing that you get from a real estate agent, like the number one thing that they're giving you is the negotiation between party one and party two. If two people try to buy and sell a house together, it doesn't work because you're trying to win, you're trying to beat that person. You need a third party in the middle to say, you go over there here, you go over here, and I will do the negotiating. Mm -hmm. That's where the value is in real estate. Right. And where the value is in financial advice is things like that. It's telling a client what they don't know. Like, if you don't know something, how do they ask that question? So there's that. There's the, um, uh, the psycho psychological elements of it of, you know, you're doing this, but it's actually this. The amount of times I've sat in front of a husband and wife and, and been the psychologist and said, well, what you're saying is this, but what you're hearing is this. Like it's like it, it, these human interactions is where the value is. It's not, in you know, the devil is in the detail, but it's very much a high level human interaction, which I don't think is going anywhere. Uh, do you spend much time on education? Educating the client or educating myself? Education uh, to the client. 100%. That's like step one. 
Yeah, right. And because of your background in property and property being such a huge part of Australian's wealth, do you find you're talking quite a bit about property in your meetings? Yes. and So yes and no. What I spend a lot of time doing is you have the Australian property person and I'm actually educating them in everything that's not property, but I'm using their language. So if you go to a property person and say, I understand property, but now let me explain to you shares in the markets through the metaphor of property. That makes so much more sense to them than it does if you say property's crap and let's talk shares. Dude, that's awesome. Have you done yeah. a video on that? Uh, no, there's, I've got a list of about 100 videos to do and that is one of them. I would uh, love to see that. that. That is rad. Because if you say to somebody, you know, how, what do you want to retire in? Uh, they feel safe with property. We go, okay, yes. well, what if I can take away your property manager and your tenants? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Well, now we're talking about a property fund. Oh, okay. We're now talking about shares. So now we're saying between a property fund and this, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you've got to like walk them along that, um, that process. Um, and it's, I don't want to be too generalizing, but when you're talking property, you're talking tax. A lot of Australians bought property for tax purposes. So if yes. you can start the conversation around tax strategy, um, that's also a big thread. Yeah. Interesting. That's uh, what was, so I started my career out in tax accounting and basically it was just property. Just like I was, I was doing, you know, maybe five to 10 uh, clients a day. They mostly had property and I would go through and we'd talk about, you know, how much money that they lost that year based on their investment. But yeah, and it's a good thing. Yeah. 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 And, you know, congratulations. Uh, you, you've um, lost this much money, therefore you'll pay less tax. Yep. But for whatever reason, I was never able to transition the conversations that I would have so often there into my financial advice practice. And I, I always found that as, an, as a personal weakness in my, uh, in my offering was that I was just never able to, for whatever reason, I just separated them in my mind and I wasn't able to sort of connect them. But if I look around and I see some of the, the best financial planners, property is just a natural part of the conversation that is happening with clients and it happens so comfortably. And yep. probably when you get good at it, it's almost like, well, how, how could you not talk about property and be a financial planner? So if there's anyone out there that like wants to somehow start having these conversations and introducing it into their conversation. How, what's the best way to do that? Um, oh, so where a lot of mine came from, yes, I've got uh, history in property, but I came at, like I was saying, I came out of uh, AMP Horizons with this knowledge and I'm looking at say my father who's 60, got a bunch of investment properties. And now how do I talk to this person and show them the value of managed funds, show them, explain to them accumulation phase and pension phase, explain to them that if you sell a property, realize a capital gains tax, put the money into super, invest that money, now not pay tax for the next 30 years, how do I show that that's a good thing and not a bad thing? Totally. You know, if I'm starting a conversation with sell a property and realize and pay capital gains tax, they, they will start looking at you like you're some kind of idiot. But if you can show them the numbers, you're now going, hey, there was a, you were, Property investors were told this story about property that that was the magic bullet, but it's not. It's the first half of the investment journey. When you're employed, you need growth assets. And when you're retired, we need yielding assets. What does that transition look like? So to answer your question is, I, I was like, well, how do I explain it to my dad? And I now can explain it to clients. So pick a target market. Like I was saying, put your person, put yourself in that person's shoes and then reverse engineer it. So that's, how I did it. How would a financial advisor go about learning about property? There's two parts. One is the, do you know how contracts work? Do you know how the real estate market works? Do you know how capital gains tax works? So you need to know it technically, yes. which is probably the easier part. And the other part is knowing the psychology of a property investor and how they find themselves to be there. Like they're, they're a very do it yourself person. A do-it-yourself investor doesn't want to talk to a financial advisor. So you need to understand it and then get past it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially because advice is moving further and further away from any sort of link in terms of put your money with this platform or managed fund, therefore I get paid. Um, 
it just makes more sense to start talking about the overall um, picture mm-hmm. of someone's wealth, say like my prosperity, for example, that's a big thing of what they focus on. It's, you know, like you've got your uh, investments here um, and your property here, and we're going to count it all together. Um, oh man, like I, it, it's kind of interesting if I look back on, on my career, I've been out of advice now for about three years. Um, it blows my mind considering the amount of conversations I've had that I wasn't doing it. So um, yeah. So I think like, if you can sit in front of a client and ask them questions they don't have answers to, that is like step one. So if a financial advisor who hasn't got uh, experience in property, you can still sit in front of a client and ask them questions they don't have the answers to. Investment property number one, what is the yield of that property? What's the net net yield? When are you gonna pay the mortgage down? When is your zero debt date? What is your retirement plan look like? Should you hold it? Should you sell it? The client's gonna answer with, I don't know. And mm. then how do you help them? It's all through financial modeling. So not only is uh, our advisors anti-property, a lot of them don't do that much modeling because the modeling inside X plan is um, muddy is how <laughs> I would describe it. Right. Uh, so I tried X plan and I got rid of X plan and I moved to a different solution. What, what do you use for modeling? So I use advisor logic. Um, advisor logic, right. Yep. They, there's pros and cons to all platforms. Yeah. And yep. I think, if you talk to advisor, um, people, no advisor CRM is right. So you just got to find what's right for you. Totally. But they're, they're, I found their modeling is the best. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. And I've, I've got a soft spot in terms of, uh, you know, like tech is difficult because advice is so dynamic. Tech is so static, you know, to catch up with legislation takes them six months and they're always behind the ball. Like you can just never catch up because yeah. you can't rapidly develop all the new changes overnight. So, yeah, it, there, there is no, that, uh, it's kind of funny because I, I, I did 12 months um, consulting at advisor ratings on, on their new product to give advisors the chance to rate products. And um, as they were doing those, the ratings, it, the, the early results came through and all the net promoter scores across the board for every single piece of tech was quite low. Yeah. Yep. And there, there wasn't sort of this shining light, this shining star in any of it. Um, it, you know, and it's self-explanatory, self-explanatory why. The, the more that I've gotten a grasp of the tech world, because I've been attempting to, to be a part of it for the last few years, is I now specialize, I, like I now prefer to specialize with like one thing. So this, this piece of tech does this one thing, yep. and then this piece of tech does this one thing and this piece of tech does this one thing because i've tried to work when all the things go together and when you know some of the biggest companies in the world attempt to do this and they just it just gets too complicated to to create a a whole thing that does everything so i now prefer to select so i it's like a uh, whatever you call a scale and at one end you've got one piece of software that does everything and the other end is you've got 25 different bits of software yeah. So I, 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 the perfect is up this end, but the 25 bits of software I'm allergic to as well because <laughs> do they talk to you? Am I double entering data or whatever? Yeah. So going back to your net promoter score, if they, instead of giving one score for each CRM, they split it into categories. Who has the best modeling? Who has the best CRM? Who has the best client interaction? Who has the best compliance? Who is easiest to outsource to a plant, power planner? Who is the lowest cost? You split it out to there, all of a sudden you, the field is now different and I go, that one is for me because I'm looking for these elements. One yes. advisor is looking for the best insurance um, premium calculator. Great, off you go, um, risk researcher. But if you're going for modeling, I think it's, um, you know, advisor logic. And if you're going for something else, like there's, uh, uh, interestingly, advisors are doing research all day, every day for their clients and then not spending yes. that much time researching for themselves. That's a good point. Um, here's, here's a question that I like to ask advisors. Um, what, what is your best question? So if good advice is good questions, what is your best question that you like to ask clients? Oh, I don't know. Is my actual answer. Oh, it's, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, like advisors say, oh, I've got this structure and I sit in a meeting and I follow this structure yes. because of my personality. I like to keep it organic Sure. and I will, I will sit and start having a conversation. It will then go into advice. It'll be talking about something. And it's, it's very, 
it's all over the place. And I will fill my fact find out just during a conversation in different part. There's no order to any of it. It just happens and it always happens. So my favorite questions are asking questions they don't have answers to. And because so if I can, if, I, if, we're, if we're going down a path and they know the answers, well, now I'm going to go in a different direction and say, well, what, what don't you know and what can I help with? Awesome. Actually, that's, that's a really, I haven't heard that response before. Um, and then as a final question, um, how are you promoting your, your content, your videos? Uh, so good question. I, it's all passive right now. So everything I'm doing is just um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, so I've just started outsourcing my um, video production where I now get back a Facebook va- version video, a LinkedIn, a Instagram. It, some need subtitles like open and some need closed subtitles. So I can just s- s- chuck it all out. Um, so I'm about to move to more of an active um, campaign, but I'm almost too busy. I need to like now hire staff to then, uh, you know, have to be able to manage it. I'm, I'm, Alert. I don't want to have too many clients. I want to be able to, you know, slow and steady wins the race. So actually, I'll, 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 I know I said it was a final question, but I'll ask sure. one more question. What, 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 cause I used to uh, try to bring on one client a fortnight. That was, yep. that was my kind of cadence. Yep. Um, I know other advisors like to bring on two, two a week. Yep. Do you have sort of a, a, in your mind, something um, that you like to I, hit? I would say one a week is okay. probably that, you know, as a ballpark, that case, but, but, yep. but, but there could be, there's one SMSF, there's one SMSF and one quick insurance. Like it could be varied. Yes. Um, and, but I, I would rather spend all of my week talking and doing marketing and doing all that kind of stuff and doing, I'm, I'm doing a lot of admin myself. I just want to get rid of all of it. Mate, I, um, I've spoken to a few advisors in my time and I can see you are on very much the right path and, and on a cusp of sort of getting to that stage where you can start outsourcing a lot of this stuff. And I think you are probably, if we were to do this conversation again in a year, which I'd like to, yeah. I'm sure you're probably going to have some of those things in place, man. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah good. good luck for the next year. So thanks. Thanks so much for coming on, sharing thanks with us me. your thoughts. Um, you had some really cool insights, especially around that property piece and videos and uh, man, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Talk to you soon.